Hey everyone, this is Jeff Young, kinesiologist, and this is presentation number four in a series of presentations that I created on medical fitness. The last one was on sports medicine concepts and guidelines as it relates to resistance training program design. And on this one, I'm going to build on that and get a little bit more into the design of the program. And I'll just continue to build on it in the next video as well. I want to start off by explaining how I set up exercise prescription. But before I do, I want to give a quick background on periodization since there are many people who have either never heard of it or they aren't very familiar with it. Back in the 1960s and 70s, when the Russian and Eastern Bloc countries were destroying everyone in the Olympics and pretty much every sport, a strength and conditioning team from my hometown of the metropolis of York, Pennsylvania, or more specifically York Barbell, went to Russia and basically asked them, what the heck are you guys doing? And they learned that they had developed an approach to training their athletes, which applies to aerobic exercise and um, sports, but in this case, I'm going to be relating it to resistance training, and it's called periodization. And all periodization really means is systematic variety is the systematic manipulation of the variables that are involved in designing a program so in other words things like frequency volume intensity sets reps order of exercise choice of exercise and when you're learning about periodization in textbooks they'll use terms that i've found that a lot of people find confusing such as macrocycles and mesocycles, microcycles, undulating, conjugating, uh, things like that. But what I like to do is explain how should we set up the session itself? How should that session fit into the scope of a week? How should that week fit into the scope of a phase? And how should that phase fit into the scope of a cycle? So before I get into the details of a scope of a session, let me first say that in medical fitness, it literally doesn't matter what condition the person has, whether it's you know, a disease or, or an orthopedic issue, or where they have it, if it's an orthopedic issue. I set up my sessions the same for nearly everyone. There's definitely going to be some slight differences, which I'll explain in, in a future slide. But the reason why I'm bringing this up is because you hear all the time the importance of individualizing your program design for, for people. And while that's definitely true, what's equally true is that there are more similarities to program design than there are differences. And so I'm going to be explaining that as well as I go through these slides. So first of all, the way I set up my sessions is that the first thing my clients do is they perform self-myofascial release, foam rolling, lacrosse balls, tennis balls. And the first before I have them perform self-myofascial release, I perform a, a trigger point assessment on them. That's one of the ways I individualize it so that they can know where and so I can know where their trigger points are and what areas of their body they should be focusing on. So we start off first two, three, four minutes of the session performing some self myofascial release. Do you need to do that way? Absolutely not. But one of the main points is self myofascial release should still be part of their program. Even if you choose not to do it at the start of the session, you should still perform a trigger point assessment. And I'll show how to do that in my assessment video that's coming up. And then you should have them release their trigger points. It could be after the session. It could be on separate days, however you want to go about it. But everyone should be performing self myofascial release. I just choose to do it at, uh, or have my clients do it at the beginning of a session. Everyone, no matter what the condition is, should perform a dynamic warm up or mobility drills. But I, I like to keep it simple and primarily have them do things like leg swings and maybe some spinal rotations, thoracic rotation. But everyone, no matter what the condition is, should perform some sort of dynamic warm-up. I personally think that everyone should do some sort of balance exercise and that most people should do force absorption. So what I mean by a balance exercise, yes, you can do static balance where you're standing on one leg, standing on an AirX pad. Sometimes I have my clients do that, but I'm much more into dynamic balance exercises such as a backwards walk, a backwards jog if they can do that, karaoke, side shuffling, uh, because these are more related to risk of falls and spatial awareness and things like that. I also have most of my clients perform force absorption. Now for athletes, that would be things like 
hops, bounds, jumps, drop jumps. In medical fitness, I'll typically have them stand on a Reebok step. Sometimes it has no risers under it, which means that they're only four inches off the ground and they just step off of that, absorb the force and push themselves back on. Or where I'll put some risers underneath it so that it's six or eight inches off the ground, for example. But the main point is that all my clients are going to perform some sort of lower body force absorption unless they can't, for instance, if they have arthritis in their knees or maybe some sort of foot ankle complex issue like an injury or arthritis, those would be the only situations where I don't have them perform force absorption exercise. Across the board, most of my clients are performing these things. Everyone, no matter how old or young they are, is going to perform core exercises next. So that's the order that I have them in, do it in. Should Do you have to do it this way? Absolutely not. You can have them perform these exercises in the middle of the session, towards the end of the session, on separate days. But everyone, no matter what the condition is, should be performing core exercises, more specifically for their abductors, side of their butt, sideline clams or sidestepping, monster walks, sideline leg raises, and then adductor exercises. And something I like to warm up the back through versions of a bird dog or a prone extension hold exercise and then obviously some abdominal exercises as well. From there we move on to the primary workout. Now before I get into these bullet points let me say that when performed properly the self-myofascial release, the mobility drills, and the core warm-up typically take about the first 20 minutes of the session for me and that leaves me about 40 minutes to get through the the primary workout which includes three large muscle groups your legs back and chest and then your smaller muscle groups single leg uh, single joint legs such as knee extensions and curls shoulders and calves the reason why i put stretching if applicable here is because my clients are not paying me for the most part to stretch them at the end of sessions. Yes, I have some clients who prefer that I stretch them, and in that case, I'll leave about five minutes at the end of the session to stretch them. But in a perfect world, I'd rather just teach my clients how to stretch properly, and then they can do that on their own. So that gives you an idea of how I go about setting up each session. And while I don't think everyone should set up their session exactly how I do, the main point is that everyone should be performing self myofascial release to release trigger points. Everyone should perform some sort of dynamic warm-up prior to a workout. Everyone should perform core strengthening exercises, whether it's at the beginning like I do it, interspersed throughout the workout towards the end or on separate days. And everyone should be performing some sort of balance exercise, even if it's not every single session. Get balanced into the training, get some force absorption, and strengthen every major muscle group in the body to create strength balance around each major joint. And then how each session fits into the scope of a week really means two things. It means we want to look at intensity. You don't want to always go heavy, 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 and you don't always want to go light, light, light. We want to ebb and flow throughout the course of a week. So for example, if you're training each major muscle group twice per week, you want to have a heavy day and a light to moderate day. And if it's three times per week, such as three total body training sessions, you might, for example, want to have a heavy day, a moderate day, and a light day. But the point is, don't always have your intensity be exactly the same in every single session like so many people do. And then the other thing is you want to be mindful of weekly volume for each muscle group. 10 sets per muscle group per week. It's primarily for your legs, back, and chest, your three large muscle groups, is a good minimum goal to strive for. So for example, if you're training each major muscle group twice per week, then you'd want to perform five sets for legs, back, and chest in each workout. And if you're performing three total body trainings per week, then for example, in one of the sessions, you could hit your legs, back, and chest with four sets each, and the other two hit legs, back, and chest for three sets each. This is just to give an example. But the primary point I'm trying to get across here is that you want to be cognizant of how many sets you're performing per muscle group per week and try to get at least 10 in in order to maximize or begin to maximize the benefits of strength training. So that's how a session fits within the scope of a week. 
What I mean by fitting weeks into the scope of a phase and what I mean by phases is that first we want to begin with what's called a familiarization phase. I personally like to start around 10 repetitions per set and during this phase I'm teaching my clients proper form, the names of exercises, how a session flows, and I'm establishing mind-body connections by using RPE or rate of perceived exertion scales. But then this is where periodization really begins. What I'll do with most of my clients, there are definitely going to be some outlier situations, but with nearly everyone, I'm going to move them up to 12 to 15 repetitions per set, train legs, back, chest, calves, and shoulders, just like I mentioned in my previous slides. I'm going to stay at this repetition range for those major muscle groups for a two to four week phase. Now let's say that each of my phase lengths are four weeks or one month in length. My, the goal is to increase strength during the phase so that by week four, at the end of the phase, they're a little stronger at 12 to 15 repetitions per set than they were in week one. And what this does is not only get them stronger at these lighter weights, but it prepares their body for when we drop two repetitions and move to 10 to 12 repetitions per set. It's, it's the beginning of systematic variety. I'm systematically adding variety into their program by dropping the repetitions by two keeping them there at a two to four week phase. And once again, let's say it's four weeks, I increase strength during that phase so that at the end of the phase, they're a little stronger at 10 to 12 repetitions per set with a little bit more moderate level weight than they were in week one. And then I drop them to eight to 10 repetitions per set for another two to four week phase. Increase strength during the phase. So at the end of the phase, they were, they're a little stronger than they were in week one. And then this depends maybe at the beginning I might not drop them to six to eight repetitions per set and I'll swing back around to 15. But in a perfect world situation, you want to sooner than later get them down to eight to six to eight repetitions per set. ACSM, the American College of Sports Medicine, defines resistance training general fitness as the six to 15 repetition range. So this is a way to systematically train clients through the six to 15 repetition range. You start at 12 to 15, you stay there for a phase, you move down to 10 to 12, stay there and get them stronger in that repetition range. You move them to eight to 10 and then to six to eight. This is an example of linear periodization. And it's the it's a primary way that I train the majority of my clients, no matter what their condition is. And then how these phases fit into the scope of a cycle. A cycle is really nothing more than the sum total of phases that you take your clients through. So in the example that I gave before, I took my client through four four week phases so 12 to 15 10 to 12 8 to 10 6 to 8 and the sum total of that would be a cycle it typically lasts three to four months to get through a cycle depending on how long your phase lengths are and then from there in a perfect world you would take about a week off you allow your body to recover and recuperate from the cycle that it just completed you can still do aerobic training the truth is you actually could still strength train but just go really light for a week and as like a detraining uh, recuperation week and then you cycle through it again and what happens is the next time around they're stronger at 12 to 15 repetitions than they were the first time and they're stronger it, actually they're stronger in each phase than they were the first time around and then you just continue to rinse and repeat or you can move to what's called a non-linear model which is something that I will explain in a future video so it's really important to understand but those are the similarities from client to client. I have all my clients train every major muscle group in the body, vary intensities, train through a spectrum of repetition ranges, typically four repetition ranges between six and 15, starting lighter and moving down. But there are differences between one person and the next. And these are the key differences. One is how much you're gonna load them when you first start. Some people can handle heavier weights in the beginning than others. Another is your rate of progression. Some people can progress a lot faster and some people need to progress slower. This is a major difference between one person and the next is your choice of exercise and basically just understanding in medical fitness what your knee, spine, and shoulder friendly exercises are, determining which ones you need to insert in your client's program, and then choosing your rate of progression for that client. And then the other thing that's going to really differ in medical fitness from one client to the next 
is their the range of motion that they can work within. So by available range of motion, I actually mean two things. Their pain-free range of motion, and also for those who have movement restrictions or areas of tightness, then by definition, they're limited in their range of motion or the available range of motion they can work within because they're tight. But that's the reason why I put this bullet point. We're going to be working on mobility. So over the course of time, as you increase their strength and time is healing the wound, this, this limited range of motion in most cases is going to increase. So that what was their available range of motion one day, weeks or you know, a couple weeks down the road, maybe a month down the road or so, you're going to start to see that their available range of motion increases because their pain's getting less, they're increasing their mobility, they're strengthening, and the result is that th their overall range, available range of motion increases. So I'm going to finish this presentation by talking about two really important concepts to understand that relate to return on investment, or in other words, making sure that the intensity of the session is safe, but still high enough that your fitness level and therefore your health is going to continue to improve. The first concept is the merging of rate of perceived exertion, or in other words, how much effort you put into a set, movement velocity, the speed of movement of the repetitions, and then something called repetitions in reserve. So when you perform a set, the set by definition was either a warm-up or a working set, and both warm-ups and working sets fall on a continuum of effort or intensity. So allow me to explain. A 10 on a scale of 1 to 10 is muscle failure. You had no repetitions in reserve because you took yourself to muscle failure, and there was a complete stop in the movement. A 9 on a scale of 1 to 10 means you terminated the set knowing that you had 1, or in some cases it's 1 to 2 repetitions in reserve, or in other words, left in the tank, and the slowing of movement almost came to a stop. An 8 means you terminated the set with 2, or in some cases 3 repetitions were in reserve, and the slowing increased. And a 7 means you terminated the set with 3 or 4 repetitions in reserve, and the slowing is in its early stage. But the point of all this is, and this is really important to understand, that when the velocity of movement has begun to slow, you are in close proximity to muscle failure, assuming you didn't take yourself to muscle failure. It means neuromuscular fatigue has truly kicked in and you will get the benefits of strength training. But if you terminate a set and the speed or the velocity of movement of the last repetition was the same as the first repetition, then it literally doesn't matter how hard you think it was, it was a warm up. The velocity of movement has not truly kicked in and you're not gonna get a return on investment. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because so many people, whether it's in rehab or in a gym setting, choose loads and they terminate a set when the truth is, if their life depended on it, they could have gotten 5, 6, 10, 15, 20 more repetitions. They are choosing loads that are too light. And as soon as they think that fatigue just kicked in, they'll terminate the set, but they don't continue to set until the velocity of movement has begun to slow. So if you're a coach, training your client, or if you're just a gym goer watching this, you don't want to start off training with this intensity, especially in medical fitness. You actually do want to start in the familiarization phase where the intensity is only about a four, five, or six, or in other words, that's a warm-up set. You don't want the velocity of movement to slow at first because you want to make sure that this person with, with whatever disease or musculoskeletal condition they have, that their body will respond well within their comfort zone before you take them out of their comfort zone. So you start them off at a four, five, or a six. You make sure that the velocity of movement didn't slow. You stay there, for example, for like a two-week phase. And if their body responded well, then you move up in intensity, maybe from a five to a six. And you stay there for a two-week block. If their body responded well, then you move them up to a seven. But once again, a seven means that at the very least, the velocity of movement the slowing is in its early stage. It has begun to slow. So hopefully I did a good job of explaining this and because this is a really important concept to understand. And then the last concept I wanted to explain in this video is something called Henneman's Size Principle, which I'll explain in more detail in a future video. But I wanted to at least include it in this one because it closely relates to the last concept that I just explained. Because of the body's amazing need to be efficient and conserve energy, the brain 
recruits only the exact amount of muscle fibers needed to perform a task and not one fiber more. And there are two mechanisms that determine how many fibers your, or muscle fibers your body needs to recruit. One is how heavy the load is. The heavier the load, the more muscle fibers the body needs to recruit. Or in other words, how close you are to your one rep max. And the other is how close you are to muscle failure. When you're in the one to eight repetition range, which is 80% or greater of your one rep max, which if you look at the chart down here, the one to eight repetition range is very heavy, heavy, and the heavier end of moderate weight. Because of the load, all strength fibers need to recruit, be recruited from the start of the set, and therefore you're gonna have a significant effect on your strength and, and possibly hypertrophy. The only reason why I say possibly is because down here in the one to three repetition range, there just isn't enough time under tension to significantly affect hypertrophy. But once you get up in here and beyond, then assuming you're taking yourself to muscle failure, you will have an effect on the growth of lean muscle tissue, or in other words, hypertrophy. As the loads lighten, and now you're in the 10 to 15 repetition range, which is 60 to 75% of your one rep max, strength fibers are still recruited early in the set, especially with multiple sets because of fatigue kicking in. You will still have some effect on your strength because the load is still heavy enough, but now you're starting to get more, the adaptations are starting to get more into what's called local muscle endurance, otherwise known as strength endurance. And because you're taking yourself to add or near muscle failure, you will still have an effect on hypertrophy. But when you get beyond 15 and especially beyond 20, such as the 20 to 30 repetition range, where now the load is below 60% of your one rep max, you don't recruit strength fibers until the last few three to five repetitions of the set which means, for example, let's say it's a 25 repetition set. You aren't even recruiting these larger muscle fibers until the very end of the set, about the last three to five repetitions. So because the fibers weren't even recruited till the end of the set, not only is the load not enough to train, to actually train your strength fibers, but the time under tension isn't enough either because they weren't even recruited till the very end of the set. And because of that, you're not gonna have an effect on your strength, but because you took yourself to at or near muscle failure, you probably will still increase um, hypertrophy or lean muscle tissue. But the point of all this is that it's really important to train across a spectrum of repetition ranges and making sure that over the course of time that your clients are training at eight repetitions per set, six repetitions per set if you can, even drop them down to four. I train my clients in a clinical setting. All of them have joint pain. Most of them suffer from disease, including cardiovascular disease or neural nervous system diseases. And while I might start off initially training them in the eight to 15 repetition range, most of my clients eventually will be down here training at six and in some cases four reps, primarily because I am not taking the muscle failure, but I am training them to where the velocity of movement began to slow, so I know there's gonna be a return on investment, and I'm loading them up where not only are they gonna increase lean muscle tissue, but they're also gonna increase their strength. And so I'm maximizing the program design and improving their health because I'm improving their strength as well. And the reason why I included this bullet point is because Dr. Bill Kramer, who is the premier strength and conditioning researcher in the world, has a great article called The Strength Training for the Warfighter that anyone can bring up. All you have to do is go to Google or Google Scholar, type this in, and he gives a great overview of the size principle. And then with these last two slides, this particular slide is just to show that with everyone, we wanna start them off light intensity and low volume. So in other words, the frequency is gonna be low, the volume is gonna be low because of, of sets per muscle group is only at one to two. For myself, repetitions per set is approximately at 10. And like I said in the previous slide, I actually, in the beginning during the familiarization phase, I don't want the velocity of movement to slow, so I keep them at about a five on a rate of perceived exertion scale, just so I, just so I can make sure that their body is responding well within their comfort zone before I take them out. And then this slide is to show that it gets pretty murky as far as progression guidelines, primarily because time and desire determines frequency and some people have much more time and, and the desire to train more days per week and others don't 
sets per muscle group can vary across a wide spectrum because also of time and desire. Repetitions per set actually are fairly similar from client to client, at least in my experience, because I am periodizing them across three to four repetition ranges, typically in the six to 15 range. And with the intensity, it varies a little bit from person to person because some people you might only be able to bring them up to a seven on a scale of one to 10 where the velocity movement has just begun to slow and some other people you can take to closer to muscle failure. And that pretty much wraps it up for this presentation. In the next one, I'll build on this and speak in more detail about how to manipulate the other variables, frequency, volume, intensity, order of exercise, choice, rest periods between sets, and so on. So if you have any comments or questions, please post below and I'll see you in the next video.